Like a dog. Hello everyone, Dr. Clark Von Heller. Today we're talking about intonation and singing English language. And so we thought we'd start with the Beatles. We all know this is the Beatles. This, why, how do we know? Because we are listening to their intonation, their cadence, their rhythm, and their snazzy intonation of the beautiful English language. If we think of music as a language, what language is this? I guess it's rock music, or maybe it's uh, the end of the rock era, the beginning of the pop era. But most people, of course, know the Beatles, but we know this particular type of music, not because that it's the Beatles or the, the year that it was, it was recorded, but we know it from the intonation and the stress of the words and the phraseology. Days, night, Alexa, stop. We better stop it there for uh, copyright infringement and that sort of thing. Welcome, everybody. This is Singing English, as you can see behind me. Uh, I was asked to make a presentation for the British Council, and so that's what we're doing <laughs> on listening skills, particularly pronunciation and, uh, uh, well, pronunciation skills. And, of course, how do we pronounce language for the ESL learner? of the L2, which is the target language, it's through listening. This information comes from page 252 uh, in one of my textbooks, and this one's entitled ESL Doxography. And ESL, of course, English as a second language, it's the same as English as a foreign language if it's in a different country. Uh, the study is based upon the idea that learning English uh, can be made simpler by showing students not only the grammatical format, which we're very adept at, you know, the, the vowels and uh, the verbs, the subjects, but also the intonation as well. Because the icing on the cake for an ESL learner is the ability to speak the language. That's why they're in class. Now, there are some, and I've had some medical doctors from China, for example, uh, who were in class not to speak it, but just to be able to read and write it. And I took a course in Hebrew for the same reason, not to speak it, because that would be impractical, because I live on the other side of the world, And uh, but I did want to be able to read it. And so uh, sometimes we, we have, of course, I teach adults, and so with adults, uh, they already know why they want to know to learn that second language. Whereas often children, of course, you know, they're in school because they have to be, of course. Okay. Uh, all languages are sung. I know that sounds kind of strange, but remember, languages are vibrations through the vocal cords uh, when we speak or when we sing. And so these vibrations uh, are going to have four things that we're going to look at today. And those are stress, intonation, cadence, and inflection. All languages, in one form or the other, have these four elements. Language contains rhythms to help join the elements together and the words, the phrases, etc., etc. Modern-day speakers of the popular European languages are not as prone to sing their languages as they were back in the uh, 30s, 40s, and even 50s. If you watch the, the movies uh, in English language uh, from Canada and the United States, of course, usually it's Hollywood, you will see that there was a, a major shift in singing English language from the 1940s uh, to the current era. And of course, that's just part of the evolution of a language. In Mexico City, they're very famous for singing Spanish. I mean, you know, all languages are, are sung, yes, with, with uh, intonation and the up and down and the stress, etc., as illustrated by the music here. But also, uh, some people do it uh, uh, with great emphasis and with great joy uh, to, to entertain people, because language is so entertaining anyway. In Mexico City, uh, the people especially, they love to sing their language, and, and, and they're very well, well known for it. But of course, the British are as well, you know. When one speaks correct uh, Thames Valley English, or receive pronunciation, one must slow down and bring the vowels up and down, don't they? Often we hear people who speak Thames Valley 
English or receive pronunciation, they will accent certain qualities of the vowels which are not normally accented, are they? My students ask me, how does one acquire a British accent? Well, it's easy. You just ask a question at the end of the statement, don't you? <laughs> All right, that's just a joke. Well, one might ask, does English also sing the language? And of course, the answer is yes, all languages do. Now listen to this, Mary loves me. Mary loves me. Mary loves me. Same words, different nuances, completely, completely. How about, I love you. I love you. I love you. Same words, different intonations, and different nuances, different meanings entirely. Now, the first thing that we do in this short lesson, and this is a very short lesson, is we have to identify the syllables. Remember, these students are learning the language, and so to them, this is new. And so first, we just want them to hear. And so I take some examples from literature. By the shores of Gitche by the shining deep sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon Nokomis. Again, by the shores of Gitche by the shining deep sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon Nokomis. And you can use Edgar Allan Poe, you can use Keats, you can use Shakespeare. Uh, so long as you get some type of rhythm, that uh, that's, I mean, all have rhythm, but some rhythm that's very, very apparent for the English language learner. They like the, the staccato sounds, because that way they can identify the stress. And review that poem over and over and over, and they love it. It's a song. Well, it's a poem. Poems are meant to be sung as well. Stress, intonation, cadence, and inflection. But first, we have to identify the syllables. And so how we do this, of course, there are, this is secondary for teachers. I know teachers know how to do this very proficiently, uh, but it's through listening. The word tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And of course, they can beat it out tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then use it in a sentence. Tomorrow is going to be Wednesday. Tomorrow is going to be Wednesday. And if I'm emphasizing the word tomorrow, the students... I don't care how they break it up, so long as they realize there are three syllables. Uh, yeah, okay, there are three <laughs> syllables, exactly. Which, which the, the, the first illustration was instructions, instructions. And I'm going to ask them upon which syllable is the stress. So let's go back to instructions, instructions. Instructions will be given on how to react to a fire drill. Instructions will be given. First of all, how many syllables? Three. And now, on which syllable is the stress? Instructions. Instructions. And so they'll divide it here, and then on this little line, they'll put two, because it's on the second one. How about tomorrow? Tomorrow. They. I really don't care how they, I'm not too picky about this. They don't have to consult a dictionary even. Uh, they can guess at it tomorrow, but divide it into three syllables. And they can work in pairs. It's more fun. And then they choose uh, on which syllable is the stress. And of course, tomorrow is also on the second one. And they'll see a pattern that usually with three syllable words in English, I would imagine that would make a great research. And I'm sure it's already been done by David Crystal and all of these greats. But um it would probably be on the second one. All right. And then we're going to, to evolve into the primary and secondary accents. Uh, the sample is secondary. 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 First of all, how many syllables? Four. Where's the accent? S. S. And then D. Secondary. Secondary. And if we we're going to map it out in a moment, it is going to be sec. Wait, we're going... From left to right. Secondary, secondary, secondary. And we'll see that on the large board in just a moment. And then uh, we're going to the identify the number of syllables. 
Oh, this is the very same thing. It's just more. And the teachers can come up with their own words, and there are lots of lessons that you can find on syllabization. And then we're going to actually start writing the music. Now, writing the music is a lot of fun. Uh, have the students to make their own lines on their own paper. Uh, why? Is because it's kinesthetic, and uh, they will appreciate it more, and all of that. So they just line their own paper with five. Now, this is a musical staff. They don't have to know whether it's the bass clef or the treble clef or any of that. We're not going to go into details of music. They're just simply writing music. They've all seen music. You know, everyone has seen music. And so uh, they know the concept, et cetera, et cetera. And with adults, it's, it's just a piece of cake. And they really, really enjoy it. I, I just can't get over how much they enjoy it. And so uh, once they make their own music here, uh, here's the word tomorrow. Always begin with the middle. Always begin with the, the middle, which in music would be every good boy would be a B. But it doesn't matter with the third line, because that way they can go up or down on, on the subsequent syllables. Always start on the third line. Always start on the third line. Very important. And so this is tomorrow, tomorrow. And it doesn't matter how high they go, so long as they go up and they hear that it's going up. So tomorrow, tomorrow. It doesn't matter how far they go down at the end at this point of the game. Later, they will be able to discern more carefully. But at this point, the only one you want to, to worry about or to be concerned about is this one, the accented syllable. Now the word newspaper. Newspaper, newspaper. We need a newspaper. Newspaper, it would always begin on the third one and go down. In this case, newspaper, newspaper, newspaper. Now here are, here's a little sample, and it's a lot of fun. I cannot stress that enough. They will enjoy it. I had a student walking around the hall going, Encyclopedia, tomorrow. Hello, sir. <laughs> Uh, I have a wonderful uh, teacher who graduated from one of my seminars uh, because this, this seminar has other aspects to it and it's very exciting and she uses it in her ESL classes um, well, every semester and it's highly effective and it's such a simple technique, of course. Identify the syllables, number two, annotate uh, notes to represent the position of each syllable. Number three, always begin in the middle line. That way, you can go up and down on subsequent notes. And number four, the teacher will repeat the word three to five times and, of course, use it in a sentence. Make sure that the students can hear it. Make sure they can hear it. We don't mean understand it. We just mean hear it. Make sure that they can hear it. So, therefore, a microphone is, is always needed uh, in a language class. It's, it's, it's really needed. Always uh, uh, get one. Number five. And only evaluate the stress syllable. We're only going to evaluate the stress syllable. Whatever is the stress syllable. I will go around the room real fast and check each student, make sure that the stress, and that's the only thing that my eyes are going to. And if I see it's wrong, you know, we just remediate, uh, repeat it again and again uh, a couple times, and the students, they just pick it up, lickety split, and it's very, very wonderful. And this has been Singing English Language, which is an ESL lesson for listening and pronunciation. And it comes from ESL Doxography 101. This is Dr. Clark Von Heller from the Clark Heller Institute. We're located on the beautiful Mexican-Texas border. Contact us anytime uh, through text message 956-207-4299 or email Clark Von Heller at yahoo.co.uk. Remember, teachers, get out there and help us with these students as they learn these valuable semantic skills of listening and pronunciation. Have a great day, everyone.